If there's one thing that all of us business owners, all of us brand builders have in common is we want two things. We want massive attention for our business because obviously we're going to be able to increase sales, but we also want to have lifetime customers. I mean, who wouldn't want that? Well, in today's episode, you're in for a treat because I'm going to share with you a live recording from Brand Accelerator Live with my good friend, Chris Schaefer, who's going to break this down step by step. You better get that notebook ready because you're going to need it. Well, hey, hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Amazing Seller Podcast. This is episode number 783. My name is Scott Boker, and I'm here to help you build a future-proof business so you can create the ultimate freedom. But, and there's always a but, you have to, you must take what you learn from this episode and take action, and you can become the amazing seller of your life. So if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's do this. All right. Well, like I said in the very beginning, this is exciting. This is the first time I've ever shared this recording. And that is from Chris Schaefer, who presented this exact talk, this training session, if you will, at Brand Accelerator Live. Now, the title of his presentation was How to Get Massive Attention and Cultivate Lifetime Customers. And I'll tell you what, the audience loved it. They were talking throughout the entire networking about some of the things that they took away that they're going to be implementing, but you're really going to want to pay close attention here. Like I said, you're probably going to want a notebook. You're going to want to go back and listen to this one again. And I'll also throw a a little plug in here for Brand Accelerator Live 2020. We're going to be doing it again. So if you have not yet checked out the details, you're going to want to head over to brandacceleratorlive.com. Again, that's brandacceleratorlive.com. I'll also drop it in the show notes to this episode at theamazingseller.com forward slash 783. Last year was amazing. This year is going to be even more amazing. Yes, we're going to try to top last year, but we had just such a great time and just such great speakers, but also the attendees were awesome and a ton of knowledge was shared there as well. Now, why is this really important, this topic, and why did I want you guys to be able to hear it even though you weren't at Brand Accelerator Live? Well, if you know how to get in front of your market and stand out, Bottom line is you'll make more money. And why is that? Well, because you have more eyeballs, right? If we have more people that are in our market and they get to see more of our stuff, there's a good chance that you'll increase revenue. And the way that we talk about it in building a brand is we diversify through additional channels. We're not going to get into that right now, but just understand that if we have the ability to get in front of our market on a regular basis, and that's what you're going to learn in this session Well, pretty much from there, you can play with the market as far as you can offer things that they might be interested in, or you can ask them and you can really start to build out your business and diversify your business, not just on one single channel or just one single product, okay? But it is going to also take following up with your future customers and delivering value first and then, and only then, is when you're going to be presenting offers or ways for them to purchase something through you, whether it's through you, an affiliate offer, a digital product, or maybe it's just them going over and reading a blog post and you get paid for a visitor that lands on your site. But you have to be doing this on a regular basis and there is a formula to it. There are steps and Chris is going to break this down, all of it, in this episode. So I'm going to stop talking so you can listen to this session that was recorded at Brand Accelerator Live with my good friend, Mr. Chris Schaefer. Enjoy. Now that he's been with TAS, the Amazing Accelerator, he's been a huge part of that. So he's going to, again, give you a lot of his insights on this topic because this topic is so, like I said, incredibly valuable So I want you guys to pay attention. I want you to take notes. He will leave some time open for some Q&A. But guys, help me welcome my good friend, Mr. Chris Schaefer. Come on up, brothers. Let's do it. (laughs) Crazy, right? It is. Wow, and everybody actually got up this morning. I'm going to need that there, Mr. Walker. 
How we doing? Everybody's awake? Everybody's caffeinated? Everybody's ready to rock? All right, so Scott already told you we're getting a little ambitious this morning. We're going to give you the ultimate blueprint to getting massive attention in your market and cultivating lifetime customers. That sounds like a big bite, right? Sounds like a big thing, but I promise by the end of this, it's going to be very, very easy for all of you. What we're going to do is we're going to walk through the things that you need to do, whether you're creating ads, whether you're creating emails, whether you're creating content, all of the things you've been learning this week, just a blueprint that you guys can use to make sure that you're getting that attention and creating that lifetime value. But before we dive into that, I wanted to give you guys a little pat on the back. I wanted to celebrate a little. You guys heard Scott say this yesterday. You heard Joel say this yesterday. You've probably heard some other people say it throughout. But you guys have already done the hard work, right? Everything from here on out is just implementation. All of the stuff that you're learning, you just have to actually go do it. But you took the time to actually come here and to learn this. And I know you guys are here for us, but we're actually here for you. And the fact that you're in this room means that you're already committed to doing the things that you need to do to grow your business. So I want you guys to give yourselves a pat on the back. Having said that, having talked to a lot of you over the last few days, I have a question that I want to ask you guys. And I know, if I don't see any hands, that a bunch of you are liars, but I love you anyway. <laughs> How many of you have decided, you guys all know that you need to create content, you know you should be running ads, you know you should be doing all of this stuff, but how many of you have decided not to send an email, not to publish a blog post, just to create this whole library of content. I talked to three people that said that, so I better see at least three hands. Um, or to post an ad because you don't have the perfect formula, because you're not sure exactly what you're supposed to write. How many of you guys have fallen into that trap? OK. The good news there is it's not y'all. And I said y'all just because we're in Texas. <laughs> It's businesses of all shapes and sizes. Everybody has this issue. Every single business, whether you're just getting started selling or whether you're a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar company, asks the same exact questions. What should I send? What should I post? In fact, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to work with uh, an advertising agency and do some consulting work. And they approached me about going to this large company, very large company, you guys would all know, it's a very household name, um, to pitch SEO, right, real sexy topic right there, search engine optimization, email marketing, and digital ads to this company that had been built exclusively on traditional marketing. Now, the trick with this is this was a Japanese company. And if you guys know anything about Japanese culture, you know that there are no jokes, there is no laughter, there's no joy. That's that's, that's a lie. But business is very serious in Japan. And so knowing my personality, knowing that I'm a little bit of a smart aleck, if you guys haven't picked up on that, um, we had like 60 hours of prep going into this. And basically, they sat me down, they gave me a script, and they said, this is what you will say, this is who you will say it to, and we just want to avoid any pitfalls. I said, that's fine, we got this, no problem. So I walk into the meeting, and we're sitting there. There's this older Japanese man, probably about 65, sitting at the end of the table, and everything's going great. And at one point, he looks at me, and he looks at the rest of the team on our side of the table, and he says, this is cool. We've got hundreds of thousands of emails. We're not doing anything with them. What do we send? If you guys are podcast listeners, you've heard me go on this rant before. I said, send anything. Right? It's the smart aleck answer, but it's the truth. Have you guys ever seen a war movie where people are, you know, you got like four or five guys, like Saving Private Ryan style, they're about to get to the objective. One of them steps on a landmine, the music drops away, all of them gasp, and all you hear is click, click, and the guy looks down. That was me, right? All of the people on the, the other side of the table, the people we were there to pitch to, are staring at me like I'm the weirdest person on the planet because I had the smartest, you know, the smart Alec answer. Everybody on my side of the table is looking at me in pure horror. <laughs> because I said the one thing I wasn't allowed to say. Right? So this very, very serious man pushes the chair back from the end of the table, stands up and he looks right at me and he goes, okay, anything. Yeah, 
send anything. I got to double down at this point because I got nowhere to go. (laughs) (laughs) Nobody's digging at my foot with a knife to get me off the landmine. So (laughs) I was like, yes, anything. He goes, I'm going to go make some tea. I'll be back in 10 minutes. If you guys can create an email in the next 10 minutes that makes us more than $10,000, you get the whole thing. The SEO, the ads, the email marketing. So his team leaves the room. They start a countdown clock like the one I'm looking at right now, basically, right? Like, and the second the door shuts, again, all of the air just leaves the room. Everybody on my side of the table is just gasping in horror. I said, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to send an email. I, don't know, you know? I said, what, what, what are we going to put together? So we put this together. I'm not saying send this email, but this is the email that we put together. It says, hey, Chris, Al Wright from Wright Anglers here. I had a quick question for you. Are you still an avid fisherman? If you are, when you have a minute this week, can you do me a favor and check this out? It's a new lore we've been working on that makes skip casting super simple, even with bad technique. Take a look and let me know what you think. I'll write. P.S. If you've never skipped past it before, check out this article to get an idea of just how much it can improve your next excursion. So, wrote this in about five minutes. So we've got about a minute left after the yelling and all this stuff. And I can finally breathe a little bit again because we have something. Other team comes back in the room, put it up on the projector, the overhead projector. This very, very serious man, who's now more serious than when he left the room somehow, looks at me. He goes, that's it. Huh? I said, yep. <laughs> what do you want? He goes, there's no logo, there's no branding. There, you know, that's what you're going to send? Well, you gave me 10 minutes. I don't know what you want me to do with it. I said, yeah. So they send it. Brought in $12,000 in two days. We've used that email multiple times since then, formats of this email, in any brand, anytime we've been challenged. We actually used it again uh, in February when one of the, the few people that we still work with came to us and they said, our email guy quit yesterday. It's the day before Valentine's Day. We have no idea what to do. I was like, I do. We're going to send that, <laughs> right? I got a day to make this real good instead of 10 minutes. It brought in 20% of all of the revenue they had done the year previously in the business, right? I'm not saying send this email. Please don't send this email. There's a lot, there's, there's many, many better ways to do that. But having sent this, this has now generated more than a million dollars in sales and leads from different businesses, right? Because any time that people are like, I don't know what to send, I'm like, send anything. Here's the template, right? I'm not saying send this. But what I am saying is there are things in this email that work, and that's what we're going to show you. So after having seen this work a bunch of times, we sat down, and we were like, why does this terrible email that should never work, why does this work? What are the mechanisms that make this actually function for people? But before we dive into that, I said it before. I'm going to say it again, if it goes, is just get started. Just send something. You guys have heard Scott and I talk about this. Uh, We give... Mama Angel, a little bit of a heart attack a lot of times. You guys heard us talk about, or Joel talked yesterday about his, his beautiful, lovely, extremely talented wife. Um, she does a lot of the systemization in our business. Joel, myself, and Scott run headfirst through walls. We just do stuff and then go, hey, Angel, that worked. Build all the systems behind it. But you do have to do a little bit of that in your own business and just getting started, just sending the first thing, just creating that first post and actually posting it, not building a whole library of content is gonna get you 80% of the way there. But I know you guys are actually really wondering what makes this stuff work? What made that email work? You told me not to send that specific one. You can if you really want to. But what actually makes this work? And the answer is, it depends. (laughs) That's it, Uh, I think we're here for Q&A. I could just leave you with that, but that would be kind of a jerk move. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to dive into the three-step formula. You guys probably recognize some of these words from the PACE methodology, but it actually applies to every single thing that you're doing. Whatever you guys have done, and I want you to do this right now, take out your notebooks and write down. You guys have heard about content creation, you've heard about emails, and you've heard about Facebook ads. Whatever that next thing is that I want you to do, I want you 
to write that down right now just so you have that in your head as we go through this because as we go through the three-step formula, I'm gonna show you the examples of how this kind of applies to those three areas, okay? So you'll be able to apply it to the next thing that you're working on directly. But the very first thing that we need to do is we need to capture the attention of our market. You guys have heard Scott rant about that for a while, right? We gotta get eyeballs on our stuff. How do we do that? We're gonna dive into that here in a second. The second and the most important thing that we need to do is connect with people. We need to actually connect with that audience. Once we've stopped them from watching cat videos and we got them to look at our ad, we actually need to create that connection to get them to that next step, which is the call to action. I was talking to somebody last night who said, you know, I get 4,400 monthly uniques to my website, which is pretty good. Congratulations to that. I know you just started publishing content, so that's really cool. I said, what are you doing to get their emails? He goes, nothing. I said, all right, we gotta give them something to do. We gotta call them to action. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit here as well. I mentioned a minute ago, getting people's attention. People are more distracted than ever. All of you guys have cell phones, laptops, tablets. Some of you even put them on silent, which I thank you for. Um, but everything that we do in business, to some extent, is actually interrupting people who are already distracted, right? Content is probably the least interrupting of ads and emails, but we still have to get their attention versus everybody else that is creating content, and to do that, we have to change what they're thinking about. So how do we actually do that? What does this actually look like? Well, inside of a Facebook ad, we have two places where we can do this, and, and Monica dove into this a little bit yesterday, um, but the very first line in an ad, think about when you're scrolling through Facebook. That's the very first thing that you see. That's where we need to start to capture attention. The other opportunity that we have inside of a Facebook ad to do that is the image or the video. And Monica mentioned yesterday, one of um, her clients, they were talking about the content ads that they were running. I think it was to a Forbes article, if I remember correctly. And they tested a couple different images from inside of the article. And the thing that seemed to work the best was like the picture of just people and it didn't look polished and professional and all of these things. And the reason for that we'll dive into here in just a few seconds. But those are the two places in an ad that we need to think about. So if ads are the thing that you guys wrote down, you need to think about the very first thing that you're putting down there and then what you're gonna use for that image. In terms of content, content is very similar to ads. We need to grab attention with the headline, right? If people are finding us on Google, that subject line needs to stand out. But with content, we have a second job. It's not just to get them to look at and click on something. We need to get them to read or to consume that content. So we have a secondary job in content where we're trying to get people's attention. You see that second arrow there and the third arrow there going to the subtitle and the video. We want to use media, images, videos, those kinds of things, as well as subtitles or subheads to call out to people. And there's two types of people that are content consumers. How many of you guys are massively ADD? Okay, so you're like me. I click on a lot of stuff that I don't end up reading. If I don't see something that calls out to me in a, in a subhead, I'm never gonna read the article because all I'm doing is I'm looking for the one thing that applies to me. So if content is the thing that's on your list, think about the subject, right? Think about that title, and then think about the subheads that are gonna explain to people what's in the article, what's in the video, what is that thing that they're looking for? So you can get not just the people that read every single word, but the people like me who are massively ADD and are just looking for the one thing that I need out of that. Media inside of content plays the same role that it plays inside of ads. We're looking for the one thing that will hook somebody's attention, whether they are gonna read that section, whether they're gonna watch that video, is gonna be dependent on the person, but we're looking for something that's gonna catch their eye and make sure that they get to that point on the page. Email, just like with content, we have two jobs with email. The very first thing that we need to do is we need to sell the open, as we like to call it. That's where your subject line comes in handy, right? So if, you're, if you wrote down email, the very first thing you need to be focused on is that subject line. How are we gonna get people to open the email? How do we stand out in the inbox, okay? The second thing is that first paragraph. Just like with content, the ADD people amongst us, if this does not get their attention, they're not gonna see the link. They're not gonna do anything else. They might open it, 
but they're not going to do anything else. So we have to sell the open first, and then we have to tell them why they care. Right? So if email is the thing that you wrote down, those are the two things that I need you to focus on absolutely first. Chris, that's cool. I get to see all those things. But how do I actually do this thing? Right? So whether it's an ad, a blog post, an email, the same things apply. Because what we're doing is we're interrupting what they're doing. Right? So if you struggle with this, you can ask one of these three things, or do one of these three things. The very first thing is ask a question. If you notice that ad, and you'll see it again here in a minute, and the email, I used a question for both of those things. The email said something like, hook a line and a floater, right? And all the fishermen in the room are having a heart attack, because that makes no sense. But it has a question mark at the end. That's all that matters, right? And on the ad, it said something like, have you ever heard of skip casting, right? So the people that have go, yeah, what's your take on it? And the people that haven't go, what in the heck is that, right? And it stops them and lets you do the rest of your job. That's all we're trying to do. The second thing is to leave an open loop. How many of you guys are TV show people? Like, you just binge through Netflix shows, right? TV shows are great examples of open loops, especially network shows. Not things that are released all at once that you can binge through, but the network shows. The end of every episode, they're about to whack the mob boss, and it goes to black. Your brain goes, but what happened? That's an open loop. Your brain wants to close it. So anything that ends in an ellipsis, right, dot, 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 can be an open loop. For example, you'll never believe what happened, dot, 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 right? That would be an open loop. So you can use that as a hook. The third one would be to take a stand to create some controversy. And I created some controversy yesterday at lunch because I was picking on vegans and I'm going to do it again. I have all the love in the world for vegans, but they're very easy to pick on because it's a very identifiable niche, right? So if you were selling something health related, let's say you had a diet that you were doing, you might create a subject line or make that first line of your ad or the, the title of your blog post, why being vegan is worse for animals than eating meat. Everybody that's vegan is going to go, what the heck is wrong with this person? And they're going to open the email. They're going to click on the ad. They're going to read the piece of content to see what your take is. Everybody that's a, on the carnivore diet is going to go, I knew it. <laughs> and then they're going to read the blog post. They're going to open the email. They're going to do whatever else to justify their position. Now, we don't have to make vegans angry inside of the article. We can back that up with the science, or we can do whatever it is there. But we're getting their attention, right? That's all we have to do. We don't have to make it very difficult. The second step in this process, this is the part that I see people mess up the most because it feels very, very difficult. We were talking about this last night at the VIP reception. This is the connection piece. Once we've gotten their attention, we need to actually connect with those people. And everybody goes, but how do I do that? How many of you guys have friends? I see like four hands. Y'all need to network. Um, <laughs> The, the answer to this question is, how do you make a friend in real life, right? Everybody thinks that business is this big black box, and they think of their customers as these numbers. And you, it, it's very easy to do, especially in the e-commerce world, because you're not physically handing somebody a product. It's Jane in Iowa, and you go, up the door, or you never even see the person because Amazon ships it, and you have no idea who bought it. And you don't see it in the real world, so nobody actually exists, and money just magically appears in your account. But guess what? Everybody that's on your list, everybody that's coming to your website, everybody that sees your ad, they're a real person, so let's treat them that way, right? How would you explain something to a friend? That's all you have to do. And in ads, we have a couple different ways that we can do that. We get the body copy, right? And then we have the media to back that up. So in this case, in this case of the ad, if I was going to try to explain, and somebody here is actually in the phishing space, um, and I told him this, and he's like, you're going to butcher the crap out of this, but whatever. Uh, the skip and spin technique, right? If, if you said, have you heard of this? And your friend goes, no, what is it? How do you connect with your friend? You tell them what it is. So in this case, it puts your bait in places that are unreachable for a normal cast. And actually, it won a whole bunch of tournaments back in the 1990s. Shaw Griggs, who won a bunch of the Bassmaster tournaments, said 90% of all of his wins came from a fish he caught using this casting method. It's kind of cool, right? Your friend go, yeah, 
How do I do it? Well, that's the next thing, but that's all you have to do. We don't have to make this hard. We don't have to overcomplicate this. The same thing applies in content. Now, unlike ads, in content, we get a little bit more real estate to work with. So we can get a little bit more personal with people. And a lot of you guys in this room have a personal brand, and a lot of you guys don't have a face to the brand. But you can do this regardless. It doesn't matter. What we're doing is we're using story and the power of story to connect with people. It doesn't have to be your story. It can just be a story, right? If it's your story, it's very, very easy to do because you know who you are, you know your experiences. If it's a story, you just have to think about things you have in common with your friends, the people who are gonna read your content, the people who are gonna do these things. What do you have in common with them? So if you guys take a look at this really fast, you see, I say, if I told you that 90% of all Big Bass Tournament champions credit the same technique to catch their prize-winning fish, you'd assume one of two things. Either I'm crazy, and I am a little bit, but mostly just about fishing, or there isn't anything special to it. It's a common way to fish, and it's probably how I learned to cast when I went fishing for the first time with my grandfather and I used that plastic Spider-Man fishing rod as a kid, right? That story is not necessarily about you, but it connects with your audience because everybody had a first time fishing. And most of them went fishing with their father or their grandfather for the first time. And most of them had a ridiculous fishing rod with Chewbacca or Spider-Man or something on it. And so even though you're not saying this is my story and connecting with them on a hyper personal level, you're creating a shared experience because they all have that. And if they have that little bit of experience, they connect with that piece and they want to read on. So all you have to do is find one connection piece. How would you explain this to a friend? You go, dude, remember that time your grandfather took you fishing as a kid? Put it in the content. You're going to hook them that way, right? And there is a little bit of personality injected into this as well. I'm poking fun at myself. You don't have to do that. You can just do number two up there if you're not comfortable making fun of yourself, which I clearly am. Email, same kind of a deal, right? Email and content are gonna be very similar. If you can master one, the other one becomes very, very easy. Again, you can see this is a more personal story. You could take that same piece from the intro of the content and drop that into this email and it would work just as well. I'm saying, I wanted to quickly jump in and let you know about a really cool trick I found this weekend. So what you'd say to a friend, right? Say, hey Scott, yeah, man, what's up? Dude, I gotta tell you, I'm calling you really fast. I found this really cool trick this weekend. Did you know that if you have a, just even a hook, a line, you don't even need a rod, and, and a, a bobber or a floater, it's all you need to do to find fish in water. And he's like, what? And you're like, check it out. I did it this weekend, I caught the biggest fish of my life. You're never gonna believe it, right? Everybody's like, what do I write in an email? What do you wanna share with your friend, right? Anybody can do this. Assuming, of course, you've, you've had a friend and you understand how that works. The quick step, if you guys are struggling with this, it is very, very easy. One of the objections I know that I'm going to get is, but Chris, I'm not an expert in my topic. I know nothing about fishing. I've been fishing four times, and yet all of my examples are about fishing, and they're 80% accurate. Um, all you really have to do is do a little bit of research on the topic, right? Even if you're not sharing your own content, you're not an expert in your space yet, go watch 10 minutes worth of YouTube videos and hear how people are talking about it and then think about how you would give that to a friend, right? You don't know anything about fishing? Go watch a couple minutes of fishing videos and then try to explain it to your friend. You don't literally have to like call a friend and do that. If that helps you, go for it. But that's all you have to do to create the connection. And everybody thinks you have to go through this giant elaborate process you have to do all of these crazy things. But if you're able to talk to a friend, you're able to do this business thing. You're able to create this content. You're able to send emails that convert. It's actually really easy. And it's easier to create this stuff than it is to go through this whole other process of diving into all of the keyword research and doing all of these things, which you can still do. But if you master this portion, the whole rest of that stuff, all of the other nitty gritty tactical details things, just make it that much better. Calls to action. I'm not going to call you out specifically by name, but you know who you are, because I already made fun of you. What are you doing, and what do you want them to do next? Why are you doing it? Why are you sending them the email? This is the thing, and it's mind-boggling to me, because it happens in businesses of every size. People go, yeah, I sent him an email. He didn't do anything. All right, well, what would you ask him to do? 
I don't know, I just told him that the thing existed. Did you give him a link? Nope. Have you ever been talking to somebody and they're like, yeah, man, Super Bowl's coming up and I'm going to have this big party. We're going to have all this great food. It's going to be great. The Eagles are actually going to win. It happened once. I can take credit for that. It's fine. <laughs> right? And they're telling you about how great this experience is going to be. They're telling you about all of these things. And you're like, awesome. I'm going to get to go to this party. And then they don't invite you. They just walk away. <laughs> okay, maybe that's just me. Um, <laughs> I need better friends, apparently. I need to do more of a connection piece. But that's exactly what happens when you don't give people a next step, when you don't give them something to do. If they come to your website, you're getting those 400 or 4,400 monthly uniques, and you don't give them something else to do, they're not going to call you up and say, hey, man, you didn't invite me to the party. But they're not going to open your emails anymore. They're not going to come to your website anymore. They're not going to be your friend anymore, right? So everybody thinks that this is like the business thing. This is where we got to sell people really hard. No. We're just saying, hey man, if you want to do this, if you want to learn how to skip cast, here's a way to do it. That's all you have to do. Keeping in mind that you're talking to your friend, that's all you need to do when you're creating a call to action. And this is something, once you start to see these, once you start to do this once or twice, this is real easy. I'm going to show you a couple examples of the world's sexiest calls to action right here. This ad is actually modeled off of an ad that I'm running right now that is getting a six to one return on ad spend in Facebook. And it's actually being run to a subscription product, so it's well more than six to one. But I actually messed up the call to action here. But it still works, because Facebook is very forgiving that way. They give us a giant space at the bottom of the ad that has a button that tells people what we want them to do. Buy now. Weird. Shop now. Learn more. What are they going to get if they're interested in this thing? If we've hooked them with that question, that open loop at the beginning, if we've connected with them in that video, that media, or that paragraph that we're writing, what is it that they're going to get? Well, in this case, they're going to easily master the technique if they click that Learn More button. If that's something they're interested in, if they actually care about skip casting, they're going to click on that button. Same thing applies in content, right? You notice at the top there, you heard Scott talk this morning about Hello Bar, if you were in the, the Q&A session this morning. And this is something that we use. You don't have to use Hello Bar. You can use anything. But the biggest thing that I see people missing in content is a place for people to get more stuff. Right? And somebody asked us how we get our emails. They said, do you just use contests? Actually, about 80% of our email list comes from something super sexy like this, a big green bar at the top of the page. This blog post is about the weird casting trick. We took a couple of these different blog posts, put them together. We created a guide on the 10 best casting tricks. Real difficult. Just took the blog posts, put them in a PDF, and put it on the site. If they're coming to this article and they want to learn skip casting, chances are they want to learn something else. We need to give them that opportunity. Now, in this case, we're going to ask for their email in exchange for that thing. That's all we got to do. We get a little bit of benefit out of it. They get to learn more. They get to get more stuff. If, in this case, we're selling a lore that helps with skip casting, guess what else I'm going to link to in this article? I'm going to say, hey, if you're struggling with this, if you can't get the sidearm thing right, I have no idea if that's even part of this, uh, you, know, you can't get the, the initial casting part of this right, this lore actually makes it stupid proof. Grab it here. Right? It's the same thing you would say to a friend, hey, dude, your technique is horrid. But if you use this, it actually helps a lot. Right? Email, same deal here. You guys will notice that I put a lot of thought and time and effort into the words that are linked to. Check it out. That's it, right? What are they going to get when they click there? Well, in email, it's fairly contextual. In this case, they're going to get access to the article that we're talking about or the video that we're linking to. At the bottom, we're doing exactly what I just talked about. We have a product that's relevant to this. In this case, we were running a 50% off promotion. We're going to say, hey, man, if you're interested in this, click here and get 50% off. And I actually said, head over here. It was a real difficult call to action to link to, right? You don't have to write this entire paragraph that you're going to link to. You don't have to do any of these things. Somebody asked me the other day, they were like, so what's like the best thing? What's the thing that I should absolutely link to? What are the words I should use for my call to action? I'm like, click it. Right? Like, this is not something actually creating a call to action in an email in a blog post is not something you should put 
any thought to in terms of the verbiage, right? If you want to get really nitty gritty and optimize it, you can, but saying click here works pretty well because people are smart enough to understand the context of what's going on here, right? Does that all make sense so far? Okay. So if you're struggling with this, before you create the piece of content, before you create the ad, before you write the email, what is the thing you want them to do? Where do you want them to go? And what are they gonna get when they go there or do that thing? Just think about that, jot it down really fast. There's three types of calls to action that you can use. And good brands, and I know I'm using a logical fallacy, all good brands, but all good brands do do this. Use a mixture of all three of these. Because if all you say is buy, 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 buy our stuff, buy our stuff, buy our stuff, nobody's gonna open your emails, nobody cares about your content because they know that the only thing you actually care about is not being their friend, it's selling your stuff. So you wanna get some content in there, right? And if you guys remember back to that email, that first one, click here to read the thing, that's a content call to action, right? You have promotional calls to action, that was the one at the bottom of that email, right? Click here to get 50% off. And then you have a little bit of a hybrid. Right? The thing that weirds people out the most, I think, based on the conversation that I've been having, is actually asking for a sale. How many people struggle with actually asking people to buy their stuff? <laughs> it's, a, it's a decent number of hands. The easy way to get around that for you guys is to write the hybrid. Get the hybrid call to action. Give them something and then ask for something. Just keep in mind that at some point you are going to have to send a promotional call to action. You are gonna to have to include just a promotional call to action because if you never ask them to do anything, you never ask them to actually give you some value back, you're never gonna get any value back. But if you've been giving them stuff, if you've been helping your friend out, you can ask your friend to move and your friend's gonna be cool with that as long as you get them some pizza, right? It's the same thing here. All we're doing when we run a promotional CTA is we're asking them to help us move. We've been helping them out, been helping them get their business better, whatever it is. Say, hey, man, dude, I got to move this weekend. You mind coming over and helping me? No, no problem. You go, turns out you're going to get something out of it, too. You're going to get some pizza. You're going to get some beer. We're going to have some fun, right? Not a problem. Very, very simple three-step formula. I wanted to go through this again really fast just to make sure you guys remember this. It's very complex. We were going to use an acronym, but then it worked out to k k k t So we decided not to do that. Um, but anytime you are creating an ad, a blog post, a video, it, I, a lot of you guys I heard yesterday wanted to create some video content, which I think is really, really cool, especially with um, what they went through yesterday with that whole content workflow. I think that's gonna be really beneficial for a lot of you guys. But if you're able to do this three-step process in advance, how am I gonna hook them? How am I gonna bring them in? How am I gonna capture their attention with this piece of content, with this ad, with this email. What is the thing? I'm gonna use a question, am I gonna use an open loop? Am I gonna create a controversy? It's the most fun. Um, what am I gonna do? Think about that before you write the email, before you create the piece of content. Second thing I need you to do, connect with those people. Why is this relevant to the people that, it, that I'm gonna show it to, to the people who I'm gonna send it to, the, to the people who are gonna land on my website, who are gonna search through Google to find this thing? How does this make their life better? And is there a way that I can connect it back to them, their lives, their experience, so that they actually consume the content, so that they read the email, so that I can get them selfishly to the call to action, to click the thing, right? Call to action, last thing before you create any of those pieces of content, whether it's an email, a blog post, a video, an ad, what do you want them to do? Where do you want them to go? And what are they gonna get when they get there? Having talked to a bunch of you guys last night, I know you're gonna say, Chris, that's cool. It's a really nifty little formula, but I'm not a paper robot. I'm not a writer. I'm not an expert in my space. Why me? And I apologize to who this was, but I went off on someone on Thursday. What day is it? Where are we? Uh, Wednesday at the, the opening party. I said, I'm not an expert in my space. So you don't have to be. Do you have to know everything about Game of Thrones to talk to your friend about how cool the latest episode was? Which I guess is not really a relevant reference anymore because it's not on. But if you're interested in something and you're talking to a friend, do they think that you have to be a cinematographer to talk about the latest Star Wars movie? Do they think that you have to have won every Bassmaster tournament to be like, hey, did you want to go fishing this weekend? No. Right? If you're able to do those three things that we just went through, you're able to communicate with your audience in any medium 
you're able to connect with your audience in any medium, and you're able to call to action your audience in any medium. It's really not that difficult. We don't need the excuse of, I'm not an expert content person, I'm not a writer, I can't do this. That's all tactical level stuff. If you're able to plot out those three things for the next thing that's on your list, you're able to do this. It's very, very simple. I'm not that smart, I'm just stubborn. And if you have that same mindset, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. You don't have to be the expert. You just have to be determined enough to talk to your friend. That's all you gotta do. Your job right now is to take that thing that you wrote down. Before you guys leave, I want you to brainstorm those three points. Come up with a call to action, come up with a connection piece, and come up with a way to capture those people. It should take you about 10 minutes the first time you do it. Once you've done it once, you can do it twice. The second time, it'll take you about five minutes. The third time, it'll take you about 15 minutes because you're gonna overthink it. And then the fourth time, the fifth time, and from then on out, it gets a lot, a lot faster. So your job right now is to do that. But like I said at the beginning, you have to just do something. You have to do anything. You have to send anything. You have to publish anything. The beauty of this three-step formula that we just walked through is yes, it can help you get over that initial hurdle but it also helps you analyze what went wrong and what went right. I was talking to somebody the other day, uh, yesterday at lunch, and they said, hey man, I've been sending all these emails. I said, okay, let's diagnose this. What was your open rate? Okay, your open rate was really good. You did the capture portion correctly, but nobody clicked on anything. Did we have a call to action? There was like a link or a thing to click on, right? Yeah, we missed the connection piece. Let's take a look at the email and see if we connected see how we can make that better the next time, right? But before you do that, you literally just have to do anything. So get that first email sent to your list, get the first blog post published on your site. Four different people, three or four different people in this room told me, I'm not gonna publish anything until I have a bunch of stuff to publish. Please, for the love of God, just publish something. Because then you can start to use this to optimize, to make it better, and to get in front of the people that actually matter, and to call them to, to, to action and to actually cultivate that real relationship with your audience. Now, the other thing I need you guys to do, I'm saying just do anything, but the real moral of that story is something that you guys have heard us say probably a million times. You're gonna hear us say it a million more. This side of the room yesterday I think said take, that side of the room I think said action, right? The people on this stage are here for you. We do believe in you. We are actually rooting for you. But we can't take the action for you. We need you guys to do that. Is that cool? Okay. Scotty in the room? We got some, some mics for Q&A? Does anybody have a question, I guess, is where I should start? Fluffy? I, I can't really see you. I just assume that's you. It's the most Canadian-looking person in the room. <clears throat> and you have a really nice blouse on. Thank you. It's not a picnic table like yesterday, so it's, it's fine. It is very nice, though. So. Uh, could you spend a couple of minutes just um, talking about testing, how we would um, go about doing that, say headlines or content um, as well? How would we go about making a library of, uh, or where would we go to find um, ads that have worked really well, or ads that have worked? So one of the things that you can do, Facebook has a really nice ad library. Uh, for every page that exists on the site. So if you really need some inspiration, you can do that. The real answer to that question, one is it depends, and two, you should always be testing your own stuff because I can run an ad, but you don't know my specific targeting. You don't know my relationship with that audience already, right? So you could steal my copy, you could steal my image, you could run the same ad and get different results than me. So you can use those things for inspiration, you can use those things to shortcut the process, but you're still gonna have to do the testing yourself. In terms of the capture piece, which I think Fluffy is probably where you struggle the most, uh, you would tell me that it's the connection piece, but you're a really good storyteller, um, and you're just a genuinely warm human being. So I think you got that nailed. The capture piece, getting people's attention, I think is probably where you struggle. Dude, go to the grocery store. You know where they have the magazines on the end, and it's like, You'll never believe what happened to Kevin Spacey. You'll never believe what happened in this place, right? All of those things are literally what you should be doing to get people's attention because their entire business is dependent on people who are buying cat food, stopping at the end of the register, 
and going, oh, that headline calls out to me, and buying their magazine. So if you guys struggle with doing that, read newsstand stuff. You don't necessarily have to buy it, just stand there waiting at the register and do that. That will give you a really good idea of how to ask those right questions, how to create open loops, because they do it literally for a living. Does that make sense? And then in terms of testing, I think that was the other part of your question, you gotta get something up, right? You can't test a subject line until you've sent an email. So when you've done that, you can look at it, and when you've sent 10 emails, you can say, what's worked with my audience? What are the 10 subject lines that have performed the best out of the 100 emails that have sent, right? What got the biggest open rates? What are the subjects that they're interested in? And then did open loops work? Did questions work? Does that make sense? Awesome. What else we got? Um, so we email our audience weekly. We also have a weekly blog post. Um, and one of our reasons for doing that is to try to grow sales off of Amazon. So we try to direct to our own website. We just haven't seen a lot of success in that. And we've been doing a weekly blog post for almost a year now. Um, so do you, do you recommend directing sales to Amazon? Off of it? Like it's way easier, but tracking that, like we wanna get sales off of Amazon. I'm gonna go back to slide four and just leave it up on the screen, it depends. Um, you can. So when you send those people to Amazon, do they convert for you? Did he steal your mic? I'm just gonna ask you a bunch of questions, so just leave it there, Scott. Um, we, we, get uh, we get clickers. Um, how do you track that after a click, though? So there's a couple different ways to do that inside the Amazon ecosystem, and we're gonna get nerdy for a minute. If you create a storefront, they let you actually track it one-to-one, -one, but you can also use coupon codes or correlation, right? Like, I sent an email and I got 50 more sales today. Okay, I sent an email and I got 40 more sales today again. Okay, well, there's some sort of a correlation there. What's your click-through rate like? Uh, so our open rate was, we, we've been, uh, we ran into some, was like 20 to 30%. That's good. Click rate was uh, one to two, three, one to three. Okay, I would say that's probably somewhere, and somebody can correct me, that's probably somewhere around industry average, mm -hmm. but it's not great. Mm -hmm. um, I had a slide in here that I ended up taking out. We send a 21 emails over 39 day sequence as our indoctrination sequence. Our average click through rate in that is 7%. They're getting a boatload of emails and they're still clicking through at like 6.9% because we're doing that connection piece right. So that Was would be that the- Was click rate to your product or because you obviously have several links? It's, yeah, your... so that's, that's on average. Some of those are purely promotional, some of those are purely content, and some of those are hybrid, right? right? Um, we do sell a lot of product via that sequence, and I know that because people respond to the emails and go, I bought your stuff. Uh, <laughs> even, even without the, track, the tracking side of it, but the other side of that, so I, I would take a look at the, the way that you're connecting with that audience and just see if you can make some tweaks, if you can get a little more personal. Do you guys have like a personal brand? I forget. Yeah, very personal. Okay. So. Uh, Rachel Kirk, are you in the room? Can you tell, oh, you're like right next to her. Can you tell her what works for you right now? Yeah, so I have a yoga brand and uh, with a lot of guidance from Chris, <laughs> I've started putting my personal stories into there and I'll say things like, hey, anybody else really struggling to work out right now because I just went on vacation and now I'm just like sitting on my couch for the last six days. Or uh, I, I, did a, I did an email sequence about turning 30 and how my body is different now. And people like that stuff and I get actually, so my call to action sometimes is even, if, if I'm not the only one here, can you just email me back and let me know? Because I don't want to be alone. And people like that stuff, turns out. Yeah, it's weird, right? It's weird, Chris is right. First time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, I learned a lot about content marketing. Uh, we have tried some uh, e-newsletters, uh, sent out about to 9,000 contacts, and we have an open rate about 12%. But then there's uh, almost nothing conversion rate. 
So from your speech, I learned that maybe I can create more uh, email series and uh, integrate with other digital marketing tools to uh, uh, send out, connect, and call for action. But regarding for our current situation, we have some open rate, but we don't have conversion. My question is how to figure out why, uh, why people didn't end up buying from us. How can I know why? So it sounds honestly like you have a attention problem, right? You're not doing the capture because 12% is okay. 12% is fairly low, uh, especially with a, with a 9,000 person list. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to see it higher than that. Now it may have just been targeting how you got some of those originally and we need to clean those out and, and build up. So the first thing that I would do if I were you is to clean that list up. It's actually something Rachel just ended up doing. Um, Basically, anybody that hasn't opened an email, how, how frequently are you, are you emailing? Uh, that one is not quite frequently because we didn't see any uh, result, but we have two sets of contacts. This contact, the 9,000 contacts is uh, purchase data, so I guess maybe some of them is not very relevant to us, to our business. And we have another set of data that is our existing customer. Then the open rate is pretty high, it's about 50%. And then we also have conversion rate there. So two things. If you're not emailing them that frequently, that means you're not emailing them. Everybody has the same objection, which is I don't want to email too much. If you're not emailing them, they don't exist, right? If you don't talk to your friends, they're not your friends anymore. You don't have to talk to them every day but your best friends you do, right? I wake up every morning bright-eyed and bushy-tailed to a Voxer from Scott. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, sometimes stuff's on fire. But we communicate every day, right? With your email list, I mentioned a few minutes ago, we get like a, a, almost a 7% click-through rate on that automated sequence that we send. 21 emails in 39 days, sounds like a lot. Then think about the fact that we send three broadcasts to that entire list every week on top of that. So if you are a new subscriber, in 39 days, how many weeks is that? Somebody do math fast? Five and a half weeks? So you're getting 37 emails in 39 days, and they still open at 33% and click through at 7%. You don't have to email that frequently, but you do need to email them more often. Because if you stop talking to me, I stop listening when you try to, right? So we need to email those people more frequently. But for you, I would probably clean that list at this point. So I would take anybody who you haven't, who hasn't opened the last maybe four emails that you sent mm -hmm. and send them a three email sequence just to try to get them to open it. And the email's real complicated. It says something like, hey man, you still interested in phishing? Mm -hmm. If so, hit reply. They don't even have to hit reply, but if they open the email, at least you know they're still engaged and they care and they didn't unsubscribe. If they don't open that first email, you send basically the same email with a different subject line, see if you can hook them with a question or hook them with an open loop. If they don't open the second email, you send them the third email. If they don't open the third email, you just unsubscribe them and take it down so that it's your core subscribers so you can start interacting with the people that actually care about you. That will start to fix that open rate problem and it'll get you better feedback to fix the conversion rate problem. The second thing that you need to, you need to deal with is the connection piece, right? Yeah. For those 12% of people who are opening, how are we connecting with them? Are we just sending them the Best Buy newsletter? Have any of you guys ever looked at the Best Buy email that comes? It's literally their, like, you guys, like, remember that the Sunday paper was a thing and you got, like, all the product inserts in it? It's literally a digital version of their product insert. It's the most horrific thing on the planet. Don't do that, right? There's no connection in that. They're like, buy our stuff! And then they wonder why they're going out of business. Um, you need to make sure that you're doing that connection piece. So if all you're doing is sending them promotional stuff, shift and just go back to content for a while. And then you need to figure out how to actually connect with that audience, make sure that you're not just being the company, that you're actually showcasing some of your personality, whether it's your personal personality or the personality of the brand. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, very valuable advice. Thank you so much. And, but I also have a concern. Okay. If I send that email uh, too frequently, maybe I will upset some of uh, the, the audience and they will unsubscribe from me. Good. <laughs> Good. 
if they don't want your stuff, you don't want to talk to them, right? If your friend hates everything that you're interested in and doesn't want to talk to you, do you want to talk to that person, <laughs> right? And that's, that's the biggest struggle, and that was going back to the story at the very beginning. They had about 350,000 emails on this list, and I said, when's the last time you emailed them? This is July. He goes, Christmas. I said, why? Well, I don't want them to unsubscribe. They're unsubscribed. They don't exist, right? So we need to get over the concern that people are going to, you know, in, in 50,000 emails or 300,000 emails, you might get one person that goes, dude, you're emailing me too much. Sorry about that, man. Did you not like the content? Did you not like all the value that I'm giving you? Right? That's fine. You just unsubscribe and you ignore it. It was like Pat was talking about yesterday, the guy that went all around the internet and posted all of these things about how nasty he was, right? Some people are just having a bad day and they go, you email too much. And then you get 10 emails from the other people that are going, I loved this, thank you so much, right? We have to ignore the one jerk and pay attention to the 10 people that actually care. And if they unsubscribe, you pay less to your email autoresponders to go for it. <laughs> thank you so much, that really helped. Hey, Chris. So first, I'm wearing my Game of Thrones T-shirt. I know you can't see it, but it says... Oh, I, I can now. I drink and I, I know, drink and I know things. things. I got my dad a mug that says that for Christmas. <laughs> Should I have multiple call to actions in one? Like, here's my, you know, go to my Facebook, like me on Facebook, whatever. Here's a, a content, and here's my, by the way, I'm selling something. And PM. It depends. Does it make sense? Right? The, the secret, you guys want to know the real secret to calls to action? What do you want them to do? Why do you want them to do it? Does it make sense? You don't need to put 90 things in there. But if they all make sense in the context of what you're talking about, then include them. If they don't make sense, you don't put it in. You don't need to put your product in everything just because you're trying to sell something. If you're sending them an email about the best way to cook fish, and then you say, hey, go buy our lure, that's weird. You don't need to do that. Because two weeks from now, you're going to sell them the lore either through a promotional email or you're going to be talking about the ways you can use the lore and then you'll have the opportunity to do that. I would limit it to two or three at most, but just make sure they make sense and go from there. Awesome, guys. That is all the time we got for Chris Schaefer. Give it up for him. Come on, everybody. I said Chris Schaefer. How's it going, bud? Good job, man. All right. Well, there you have it. Hopefully you have a book full of notes, or if you don't, you're going to want to go back and listen because there was a bunch of action steps there for you to do. But I do want to give you like three big takeaways that I want you to walk away with, at least if you haven't taken your notes. Number one is knowing your market inside and out is key. If you understand your market and you can drill down in that market and understand what they actually want, and I'm not just saying to buy, but what they want to learn about, what they have questions on, how can you be of service to them, and that also comes through targeting, all right, if you're running any, any type of Facebook ads or any type of Instagram stuff, or even just building a page on Facebook, you want to know who they are and really what makes them tick. And that comes down to targeting, but knowing your market inside and out. So when you have a conversation with them, you're speaking directly to them. And again, it's all about them. And that also brings me to the second big takeaway, and that is following up. Now, we talk a lot about, and Chris talked a lot about email, okay? Yes, we love email because, well, it works. And people still use emails, even though people say, Email is dead. Now it's Messenger. No, email is not dead. And honestly, I believe email will be around for a very long time because it's always kind of cutting through the clutter and the noise. Um, social media and Messenger, that's going to become noise, okay? And uh, once uh, it starts getting abused, then people will start to kind of look away from that. And then the email inbox, as long as you have supplied value, you haven't you know, hit them over the head with offer after offer after offer, and you've engaged with them and you built that relationship, well, that's where email will work really, really well. And the third big takeaway here is being real and showing up on a regular basis. Let people know 
that there's someone that's representing your brand, whether it's you or someone else, you want to have that voice and you want to also share the ins and outs of the brand. Okay. The more that you can do that, the more transparent you can become, the more people will know you, like you, and trust you. And that's where the sales are made. So those are three big takeaways, but there's a, a ton more that were in that in that uh, session that I want you to make sure that you go through, but also make sure that you take notes. So go back, listen to it again if you have to, if you were driving, if you're on the treadmill, whatever, because right there, if you understand those principles you are able to get massive attention on a regular basis. You're able to follow up with people on a regular basis in your market. And from there, the sales and the revenue will automatically start to increase if you do those other parts, all right? So if you did listen to that and you're like, you know what, I don't even know who my market is or I don't know if I can do some of these things. Well, I've got something for you if you haven't already went through it. And if you did, you need to go back through it again. And that is go through our brand growth validation checklist and that will help you identify the market and really drill down in the market and then also see what the market wants, what it needs and how you can show up and deliver that to them. And that's really the foundation of what we're talking about here. So go to brandcreators.com. Again, that's brandcreators.com and you can grab that brand growth validation checklist there. And there's some training videos there of me walking you through that process. And then the last thing that I'm going to leave you with here is if you are at all interested in attending Brand Accelerator Live 2020, where we come together as brand creators, we share, we network, we teach, we learn, and we come together as a brand creator's community, you're going to want to grab your ticket and you can do so by heading over to brandacceleratorlive.com. Again, that's brandacceleratorlive.com. All the information's there. You can watch. Uh, we have a two-minute little sizzle reel there that was put together, which is amazing. It really captures the feel and, and the vibe of the event. But then also, there's some of our attendees that are sharing their thoughts. And everything that you can look forward to is there. We'd really love to hang out with you in North Carolina this upcoming year. So definitely go grab your ticket, brandacceleratorlive.com. You can get all the details there. And I'll see you in North Carolina. All right, guys, so that's it. That's going to wrap up this episode. As always, remember, I'm here for you. I believe in you, and I am rooting for you. But you have to. You have to. Come on, say it with me. Say it loud. Say it proud. Take action. Have an awesome, amazing day. I'll see you right back here on the next episode. Hey, before you go, could you do me one quick favor? If you haven't done so already, can you head over to iTunes and could you leave me a review over there? I would really love to hear how this podcast has helped you in one way, shape, or form. And oh, by the way, I read every single one of them. And actually, I'm going to read one right now. And this one came in recently from Alan V. And he said, this is the best podcast that delivers not only free, but most important, very well organized content to help you understand and know what you have to do in your brand and Amazon business. Scott is very energetic. No, really? <laughs> and smart about organizing lots of information into little baby steps to help me take action. Thank you very much, Scott, for being an inspiration and for delivering so, so much. There's a lot of O's there. So again, I read every single one of them. I appreciate all of you. And I would really appreciate it if you would leave me one of your own reviews there as well. And if you haven't also subscribed yet to the podcast, if you can do that, that would be amazing. Talk to you later. Bye.